Uh -huh. Amen. Anything is Amen. possible. Amen. 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 Anything is possible to him that yep. believes. That's Hallelujah. Right. Yes. I am thankful for the Lord today. I'm thankful for the, the blessings that the Lord has poured Amen. out upon uh -huh. this church. Amen. Each and every one of you. Amen. We're going to ask our ushers to come today to give you an opportunity Thank to you, worship Jesus. and giving. Amen. We're so very thankful that Brother Childs has been able to come be with us this weekend. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to be in your presence. Heavenly Father, I ask God for you to bless this tithe and this offering as it is given unto you. Let it go to the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give us unto the Lord today. Amen. Praise Him. What a great God we serve. Yes, amen. amen. On on Friday night, Brother Torres gave a testimony about how he had had braces. He had he was on crutches, uh -huh. in a wheelchair, uh -huh. and the Lord miraculously Woo! touched his body. Oh, Next thing I yeah. know, Brother Torres is running around uh -huh. the church, That's right. and he's running in place. He hadn't been able to do that in a long time. And I'm thankful, and I'm thankful that the Lord is a prayer answering God. Amen. 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 We need to allow our faith to be built up. See, God operates on faith. He responds to faith. Yes, he does. Amen. So let your faith soar today. Amen. And know that God is going to do something great in your life. Oh, I believe it. Amen. In Jesus' name. But we're going to ask for the childs to come. Amen. And minister the word of God to us. For the childs, we appreciate you very much. Yes, very thankful for your ministry. Yes. Thank you for everything. Yes. And pouring your heart out to us this weekend. Yes. Amen. I want to say thank you to everybody that's here. Appreciate so much you showing up so I don't have to be here by myself. If I preached a little long the last couple of nights, forgive me for it. It's only because somebody told me to pay by the hour and man's got to do what he's got to do. And I'm just joking, praise God. I just, I welcome every one of you. And uh, it's been a privilege to several of you got to rub shoulders with a little bit. And I thank you for it. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited about today. Now, I, I really, again, I praise God for the last several nights, especially since I came here and none of you knew me. And, and um, But you just made me feel so much at home and so welcome. But I want to say, before I forget, thank you to the unsung heroes, people yes. that get up here and sing and play for us and my, get us my, into my. the presence Amen. of the Lord. And, thank you, Lord. And uh, the media, you know, people that sit in the sound booth and uh -huh. do it. And the uh, people that do all the things in the background that some of us yeah. take for granted. It's so so true. don't ever take it for granted. No. Praise uh -huh. God. And uh, they're the heroes of the service because they've made it so conducive for the rest of us. Yeah. I love you. I love the people of God. The easiest thing in the world would have been for me to just get up here today and, and just preach. Um, I, I, I would love to have done that. I had a what I thought God was going to give me as a message for today. And and uh, I think it would have been a beautiful capstone to what happened the last several nights. Um, and I don't believe we know the half of what happened the last few nights. I believe that. But, I believe but today, that. I woke up this morning and I was feeling something so unique, so uh, out of the box, which I am anyway, but I, I was feeling something so, and I, I texted Pastor because I wanted to give him the scripture and title, you know, for media, and um, I sent him two. <laughs> so I'm torn between this and this, and um, uh, but it didn't take very long after that. I, I knew which direction to go. So Thank if you'll you, just bear with me today, I want to explain several things before I do go into the word here in a moment. Number one, um, I learned a long time ago to pay close attention to what I'm going through in life. True. I've had an incredible life, and that does not mean all good. 
I've had as many challenges as anybody. I've had more tragedies than most everybody. I've had ups and I've had downs. I've had many successes, amazing opportunities, and a lot of heartaches and a lot of sorrows. Jesus. Life's life. Yeah. Bad yeah. things happen to good people. That's right. Yeah, they do. And I learned that you pay attention to everything you go through if you're walking with God. Because uh -huh. if you don't, when you get out of it, you won't have a testimony. That's right. That's right. You won't even realize what all God did for you. That is right. exactly That's right. right. I'm so glad the people in the Bible paid attention so they could write True. it down so we'd know a little of it. Amen. Amen. And uh, what would you like to go back sometime and, uh, and just have a, say you had two hours or one hour, if you could sit down with people like the Apostle Peter oh, yeah. or John or Paul, and some of those people, and just sit down with them and say, what was it like? Tell me how it felt. Tell it would be incredible. Yeah. I mean, seriously, mm -hmm. you know, who wouldn't want to do that? Mm -hmm. And make it real for me, you know, that kind of thing. Well, that's, that's what I'm going to do today. But before I do it, I, I'm, I'm a little, I feel a little bit awkward only in the fact that someone here might think, my God, he's talking about himself. No, I'm not. But I'm going to use things that, that in sequence, that are, are going to show you uh, a powerful principle in the Lord. Let me tell you how God works right before we go into the Word. It is your privilege to seek Him for what His will is for you. Yes, sir. The steps of a good man are ordered of the right. Lord, right. not by your mind. Right. If you do it, you'll mess it up. Every time. You might think you succeed, uh -huh. get into eternity and realize what you missed out on doing for God. So when you seek him until he tells you what his plan is, then you pursue that with all your heart. Right. Ups and downs, ins and outs. Right. Right. Yeah. Amen. And right. watch what God does to get you through it. And that leads to promotion to the next one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the way I define it in life is chapters. Uh-huh. And if I went back, I've written a number of books, which I don't have any of them with me, and I've got many more written I haven't even published yet. But many of them are chapters. And if you go into chapters of life, I've got chapters, and perhaps some of you do too, that one section of your life was so uniquely different than the rest of the chapters of your life. Kind of like when you read the Bible. You get chapter, chapter, chapter. But if you notice, they're not all just alike. Right. But they all weave the same story. And so I'm going to take you into chapter one. I'm entering a, a brand new chapter as we speak. I'm talking in the very days and, and weeks. So I'm in right now. I think I'm entering my my greatest chapter of life Praise because the age Lord. has nothing to do with it. I'm 69, right. and uh, and uh, but I'm more excited about my future than I've ever been. Praise the Lord. So so it's a chapter. I feel it coming because yeah. God's already talked to me about it. Uh -huh. So would you mind if I take you through a little journey? That'll build your faith probably as great as anything you've ever heard. Thank That's why I'm going to do this. Thank you, Jesus. Every one of us is here because deep inside you want to live for God. Right. Yeah. Every one of you have heard sermons and messages and teachings. Uh -huh. And I pray that you've heard good ones. Right. Amen. Yeah. But here's the problem that a lot of people have. How do I take God? Uh -huh. How do I take his word? And how do I make it practical in my uh -huh. everyday life? Exactly. Right. That's a struggle for some people because we have these pragmatic minds, you know. That's right. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you in my, my examples in my life how it works. But before I do, let me ask a couple of questions here. And I'm not going to call nobody out. I don't do that. I'm not going to embarrass nobody. I'm not going to ask you what it is. I'm just looking for a witness, okay? Is there anybody here seeking things in your life? You're looking for answers. You need solutions. You're going through some stuff. You're trying to figure it out. You're hoping to get to the other side. You're exercising faith. You're not sure what to do sometimes. And, you know, you have questions maybe. You're confused uh -huh. or whatever. Uh -huh. and uh, Or you've got things you want to do and you just have no earthly idea exactly how you're going to do it. Does that fit anybody here today? Does it fit? I mean, okay, a couple of you, praise God. The rest of you, I hope it fits you anyway. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let me tell you a story. First of all, let me read the scripture. Philippians 4, verse 19. It's a scripture that many of us can quote. And after today, I don't think you'll ever forget. But my God shall supply all your needs. 
according to his riches and glory, glory. by Christ Jesus. Yeah. Would you read that with me together one more time, all of us? Yeah. But my God yeah. shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Lord, we love you. Yes, we do. We ask you, Lord, to help us talk about the future of this chapter in Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. I was working for an engineering company, and, and this may sound a little boring for a little while, but I promise you before long it won't be. Mm, that's right. I was working for an engineering company in Beaumont, Texas, and the year was 1982. Stubbs and Overbeck Engineering, I was sitting at my desk. It was right after lunch, and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost just <laughs> moved on me. My desk was really close to the coffee bar. We had multiple coffee bars in the company because we'd done studies that, that the engineering types were more productive if they had coffee and stuff like that. So we drank too much coffee and did too much work. And I'm sitting close to the coffee bar when all of a sudden I began to burst into tears. And man, I, I just kind of, you know, you don't want to sit there and cry in front of all your working partners and everything, you know. And I, I, I fought crying for the rest of the day and I had the greatest burden I've ever had come upon me. Mama. I called my wife. We didn't have cell phones back in that day. I called my wife. I said, honey, I'm not coming home straight from work. I'm going to go to the church. i got to pray. I said, I don't know what's going on, but God has come down on me. I knew what he'd give me a burden for, something I've never known of before, thought of before. But I said, I'm going to go to church. I went to church after work and I prayed for about two hours, one of the best prayer meetings I think I've ever had at that point. God laid something on my heart that blew me away. Here I was in Beaumont, Texas, and God put it in my heart so strong to go to the Mexican people in Mexico and, uh, you know, like in a missionary type sense. And, and I knew that my life was being changed. And, um, and I didn't understand it all. I didn't speak any Spanish. I had no experience with that, you know, other than my wife's maternal uh, parent of uh, uh, Paternal, grand, uh, her, her grandparents came from Mexico and her father by heritage was Mexican, mother was white. But I knew, I came out, I came out of that prayer meeting committed, God, I don't care what it takes, I'm going to go. My engineering company uh, had merged with a company, we own 14 engineering companies in our branch offices in Mexico. So I thought, well, maybe I might go as a self-supporting, you know, missionary. And, uh, but I went home and told my wife what God had done and how God had moved on me. And my wife's amazing. I got the best amazing wife. But she, 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 as soon as I told her what God had called her, she said, Oh, God, no, anywhere but Mexico. You know? I said, Well, honey, pray about it. You know, pray about it. And she said, I will. Boy, about two weeks later, man, all I could hear her do was cry and pray for Mexico. God put it on her. So we arranged the flight. We flew down to Monterrey, Mexico. We stayed there for a week in a hotel downtown, was able to get up on the roof. We prayed over the city. We went all over the city. We didn't do anything but pray, seek God, and we absolutely knew the calling was real. But while we were there, God confirmed, yes, the calling is real. No, you're not going to go. But we would have. We would have, okay? Not my will be done. His will be done. Right. And so, so we came back. But from that day forward, for the next number of years, Everybody that knew us, anybody that knew us, knew that we were going, you know, to have a work to do somehow among the Mexican people, the Latino people. Mm -hmm. And so, it's just the way it was. Well, later, at a different point in time, the same Spirit of God moved upon me again. And when He moved upon me again, uh, I began to seek Him and I began to pray. Remember the old, uh, some of you that used to watch the Bonanza TV series? Yeah. Remember how the Ponderosa was on the north side of Lake Tahoe? And, and you're looking at that beautiful map, and all of a sudden somebody decides to burn the map up and starts getting on fire and blowing the yeah. and, uh, and I'm having this beautiful vision, and I see this, uh, uh, well, I, I heard this, uh, now let me back up a minute. I was praying, and I heard two words that I'd never heard before, Del Rio. Well, I knew it was a place, but I didn't know where it was at all. I had no, no concept of where it was. And so I went and I got a map because I wanted to see where Del Rio is. And I finally found Del Rio. It's on the Mexican-U.S. border, and it's uh, on parallel kind of with San Antonio. And, and I saw it on the map. And when I looked at the map, 
I literally thought this happened because I saw it. As I looked at the map, where Del Rio was, that little fire started, just like Bonanza. And it got bigger and bigger. And, 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 and I thought, oh, my God. And behind that came the most unbelievable burden for Del Rio, Texas. Del, I had nothing to do with Del Rio before that. But I had this amazing burden come upon me. And so anybody that knew us for the next three years knew we were going to Del Rio. That's how uh -huh. strong it was. Of course, when I told my wife the first time, I think, honey, I know where God's going to send us to the Mexican border. She said, oh, God, anywhere but the Mexican border, you know? Well, two <laughs> weeks later, there she goes again. She's got the same burden. We never went to Del Rio one time over those next three years. I never checked on Del Rio. I didn't look it up. I didn't study the demographics. I, I, we just, but we knew we were going there. I didn't care if it was a big city, <coughs> little city, rich city, poor city. I did not care. Uh -huh. We just made up our mind. And so we waited a little while. Well, in 1985, we were at that time attending Wayne McLean's church where we met in Pasadena, Texas. And, uh, and at Wayne McLean's church, God began to deal with us. And we went to assist Pat Phillips in Wharton, Texas for a year. And, 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 uh, but as we're moving, we literally moved over there. And I still work in an s and engineering in Houston, Texas. Bear with me. This does get interesting. I, I was working in s and engineering. And, uh, and we decided to move to Wharton to be more involved in church. And I'd drive back and forth. On the last trip, as we're moving the last bit of furniture, we had a new couple in the church come in. They were keeping our children for us. We had three little children. They were watching our babies for us. We went by to pick up our babies on the way out of town for the last time, going to go to Wharton. Yeah. And so as we do, they had a guest come, a young lady. And she, they said, I want to introduce you to her. So we talked a few minutes, and all of a sudden she said, oh, my God, you remind me so much of my pastor and his wife. And she began to describe them. And I said, oh, I'd love to meet them someday. She said, yeah, they had a really big church. And they, they resigned it. And they went to a little starving work on the, you know, in, in a really tough area. And blah. she just talked about this. Oh, man, I respect somebody that can sacrifice and do that, you know. I said, where in the world are they? She said, they're in a little place called Del Rio, Texas. And I said, oh, oh, my God. And I said, you won't believe this. So I told her about what we were feeling, you know. We were with her, I'm telling you, not more than 10 minutes. And, and so we left there. My wife and I were just kind of blown away. Never saw her again. Didn't talk to her again. Almost one solid year went by. My wife and I, a Texas camp meeting came up in Lufkin, Texas. And I was working at SCB Engineering. Had a lot of work to do. And, and all of a sudden, we decided, last for the moment, we're going to go to Friday night camp meeting service, Lufkin, Texas. So we go to, we go to the camp meeting service. And, I, and because it was the only one we got to, I think we are about the last ones to leave. And I had found a hotel on the far side of Lufkin that day, and about the last room available, and it was right next to a truck stop, right next to a cafe. And so we go to the camp meeting. And, and we're on our way back to the hotel, and we're exhausted. It's late. It's after midnight. And I said, honey, I sure would like a cup of coffee or something, you know? And she said, yeah. She said, let's get something to eat. Well, there wasn't any place we could really get to except the truck stop. So I went in this crowded truck stop. I mean, it was packed out. Truck drivers and Pentecostals. You know, <laughs> and and, and, uh, and we, we, we didn't even get seated. I mean, it was so crowded in there. So we stood in there trying to, trying to get waiting on and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, I said, honey, it ain't going to work. Let's just go to the room. You know? She said, okay. I turned around. Let me back up a moment. I'd only done one thing, only one thing related to Del Rio in all these years now. Even though I knew we were going, I wrote a letter several years before this incident, to B.E. Moore, who was the presbyter over churches in that right. region. Right. And so I wrote to Brother Moore, said, Brother Moore, Fred Child's here. I'm just letting you know my burden. If there's ever an opportunity or anything like that, I want to come because I had found out now that there was a church there. And well, it, I, I, was, I was actually, it was right after I talked to that young lady. So, so that's the only thing I'd ever done, period. Never heard from Brother Moore. So I told my wife, I'm in this crowded restaurant right now, and I said, honey, it ain't going to work. Let's, let, let's go ahead and go. And I turned around, and I accidentally bumped into a man real hard. And I started to apologize to him. I looked up and be more. I said, oh, my God, Brother Moore. Hey, Brother Child. See, he knew who I was, you know. And we got to talking. I said, I sent you a letter. He said, yeah, I got your letter. 
and we're talking about that, when all of a sudden, we bopping through the truck drivers and Pentecostals comes that little lady that we'd met a year before in that 10-minute interval. She said, Brother and Sister Child, you're not going to believe who's here with me. I said, who? She said, Brother and Sister Miller from Del Rio, Texas. Uh -huh. Here comes Brother Miller. He's putting his coat on. He's in a hurry. He said, Brother Child, i got to get out of town. I'm leaving right now. He said, but look, I need to talk to you. If I don't talk to you in two weeks, will you promise to call me and give me his phone number? I said, yeah. So two weeks later, I called him, and he says, hey, I want you to come preach a revival for me. And so I said, okay. And so we arranged it. We went and financed our own revival. You know, we paid for everything. We didn't get an offering. We gave an offering, you know. And, 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 we, and there wasn't but a few people there, and there was one down building, you can imagine. But I felt like I was the king of the world. But it, he was the pastor. I'm not going to be unethical with him. But when we first went to that revival, we got to Brackettville, Texas, and the moment we hit Brackettville, spontaneously, Monica and I both began to weep and we wow. travailed all the way to Del Rio. We wow. knew that this was our calling. We never said anything about it. Sunday night, after the final service there, Brother Miller said, folks, he said, if God ever calls us to leave, God has shown me that these are the people that are supposed to go to Del Rio. Wow. Amen. The night before, on a Saturday, he said, hey, would you want to go to Mexico with me to an old serve, to a service in Mexico and raising up a church? I said, yes, yes. So he took us into a barrio in old Mexico in Ciudad Acuna. About 165,000 people lived there. Turns out there were like seven major barrios in Acuna, and they all looked just alike. And, and, and with all respect, they were made out of cardboard houses, one room, dirt floors, maybe a tin roof, no electricity, no water, and thousands of people living in there. And these were areas where people would move to the border to get jobs in, in the uh, Maquila Doras. And so, so here we go, and man, I'm lost to the goose. Here we are in the middle of a field of the rocky Caliche soil, in the middle of all of these little cardboard houses in Ciudad Acuna, you know? And, and he start, and here's how he starts the service. There's nobody there, just a few people. And he starts standing up there and said, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> and all of a sudden, here come the people. Man, he had about 80 people showed up. And man, did we have church. And, uh, and I was just blown away by all of this, feeling God the whole time. Long story short, there was one lady, only one lady that really stood out to me. Her name was Feliciana. And Feliciana was so full of the Holy Ghost, she got to praising God. She had on a beautiful, you could tell it was her best dress. And before long, she's on her knees on that dress in, in, in this rocky, caliche, dirt, you know, uh, feel. And then she's on her face in that dress. And then she starts rolling in that dress. And, and so full of the Holy Ghost. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, Mickey, I'm just crying like a baby, you know? Well, we went back. And that's when he told the church that next night that these are the people for Del Rio. My wife and I came home, and we just were just blown away. But that's all we had done is we had just went and preached a revival. And three months later, B.E. Moore called me, and Brother and Sister Miller had resigned, and the church had asked us to come pastor. Now, that wasn't nothing to be excited about because there was only five people there, and one of them turned out to be a devil. And, uh, and, and, and that meant I had to leave what was a six-figure job way back then in the early 80s. And I, and, but I was going to leave that and, and go to Del Rio. And by the time we liquidated, we didn't have any money left. And so we went broke with no job, no benefits, no insurance, no income, nothing like that. And we were the happiest people in the world. We moved into the back few rooms. We had the big home, and we got rid of all that. And we moved into the back of what looked like an automotive garage, you know, almost, as far as the church was so dilapidated. And uh, we were the happiest people in the world. So we set up shop, and I, I, I'm going to have to abbreviate because there's too much amazing things happen. But basically, we begin to have revival. And from day one, I had a dual burden. I had a burden for Del Rio, yes, but I had a burden also for Mexico. Every day, I would pray, God, let me go to, over across the border. Let me, let me uh, go find that church room and start that, you know? And every day, no, no, no. Three months went by, never even crossed the border. I had my hands full in Del Rio, and, and uh, three months went by. And one day I'm praying, and the Lord said, and this is where it starts getting a little more interesting. The Lord said, uh -huh. go, for I have opened the door. Uh -huh. And so I told Monica, I said, honey, I'm going to go. Now, I was kind of scared. I'd never driven over there before. 
I didn't know my way around. It was a pretty large city. So every day I had an old Impala, and every day I would drive that Impala over there, and I did it every other day for two weeks. I never talked to one person other than getting out, going into a little grocery store, and buying a Coca-Cola or a bottle of water. As if I never talked to anybody. All I'm doing is trying to get familiar with how to drive here and, and where to go, you know? Never talk to anybody. That second week, we had a couple come over, a ministry couple from Louisiana, and they wanted to go to Mexico. So we're in the car, and we go to Mexico, and we saw one of those old barrios. Now, for two weeks, I've been trying to find that barrio, and it was like a needle in a haystack. You know, I had no clue where it was. And they all looked alike. And so this couple comes, and I'm taking them, and I'm driving around, you know, and, I'm, and we're just talking about our burden and everything like that. And they said, let's go down into this old body over here. So I turned off and went into there and just had to be careful because the roads were so horrible, you know. And, and I, I'm driving around, and uh, the dust, I'll never forget, the dust was coming down the windshield, like almost like rain. And, and it was hot. It was 100 and something degrees. And, and, uh, and, we're, and I see this elderly lady standing out in front of a cardboard house. And my heart just went out to her for the first time. First time now. I get out of my car and I walked over to her. And in my pitiful Spanish, explained to her that we may come over here and start a church. But she'd be interested. She said, si, senor. You know, and, yeah, I'll come. You know, and, and that was it. I turned around after talking to her. And we went to get back in the car. I'm getting back in the car. And I heard this, this hollering. And I couldn't. I knew it was a woman's voice. I knew they were hollering. But I didn't think they were hollering at me. I turned around and looked, and what was probably a good couple of blocks away, coming down this dusty road, there's a lady, and she's waving her arms like this, and she's just screaming, you know, coming my direction, you know, I almost wanted to get in the car and get out of there, you know, but when she's coming my direction, then I heard what she was saying, she was saying, hermano, 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 and she's just hollering at me, brother, brother, and I looked, and when she got close, she had tears coming down the dust that was on her cheeks. And it was Feliciana. My, my, my. In a 165,000 people city. My, in a barrio I couldn't find. The only woman that I would have recognized. The only one that I knew had the Holy Ghost. My, my. She comes running up to me. And there was no etiquette involved. No. She bear hugs me when she saw me. Yeah. She's crying like a baby. I'm starting to cry now. She's crying like a baby. And she says, where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? She said, I've prayed every day for My months God. that God would bring you back here. My Amen. You, so I'm, I'm going to start weaving a story of how God can work in your life if yeah. you commit yourself to God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. But for Feliciana that day, God supplied her need. Amen. Because God's a provider. Yes. And so I said, so I promised her that tomorrow we're going to come back and we'll have church. So we had our first service the next day in her one room cardboard home. Mama. And the place was packed. She was there. My wife and I were there. And that couple from Louisiana were there. And, uh, and, uh, and we had church. And the second service that the, the church multiplied. She had one other girl, lady come. So now we had two people plus us in the house. And, and uh, But the Spirit of God was there. It was like a, a, it was intent to be. And I said, hey, we can't have church in here. There's no room. You know, I'm going to talk a little bitty house here, you know. And, and she said, well, there's a place over here we can have church. And she leads me to that place. And it was that field where Brother Miller and stood in that field crying, Jesus, Jesus. So what did I do? I got out there in the middle of that field, and I started crying, Jesus, Jesus. And all of a sudden, people began to come, and service after service, people began to get the Holy Ghost. And, and, and I'd take them down to the real ground where it was pretty good. And I'd baptize them in Jesus' name. And, and one night, I'm preaching to this crowd, of course, stuff's happening in Del Rio, but there's too much to tell. I was preaching in this crowd one night. I mean, we're having moves of God in this field. And I'm preaching, and I, I felt something so strong. I stopped, and it shocked me. And I said, folks, the Lord just spoke to me. And the Lord said, we're going to have a very rough winter, and we need a building. And I had no prior thought of that. And as I'm saying that, the congregation starts dividing, and here comes a police officer. And he's looking at me, and I'm thinking, oh, my God. 
I'm fist to get arrested. You know? I mean, I didn't discern a thing. I'm fist to get arrested. You know? And he comes right up to me, and I'm I'm almost ready to turn around. You know? And he comes right up to me and he said, You need a building? I said, Yes, sir, I need a building. There are no buildings around there. It's cardboard houses, that's all. He said, I have a building. I said, you're serious? He said, I have a building. It's just a few blocks away. I've never seen it. He, and and uh, he said, uh, he said, Would, uh, I'd like to rent it to you. Would you want to rent it? I said, yeah, well, how many people would it hold? He said, I think you can get about 60 people in there. And we actually could get about 80. I'm talking Mexico style, you know. <laughs> you squeezed in it. And, 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 but hey, it was a building. Yeah. It had a tin roof on it. It was made out of plywood. It had dirt floor. So we put a concrete floor in it, and we painted it up, and we put a little sign on it, and it made a nice building. And we had single-digit weather that year. Thank God that we had that building. Yes. Amen. 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 And so and we're in that little building one night, and I'm preaching. And now Rogelio, the uh, police officer, he's in the church, and he's got the Holy Ghost now. And so we're having church one night. And the same Spirit of God moved upon me. And I said, my God, folks, the Lord just spoke something to me. I don't understand it, but I'm going to tell you what the Lord just impressed me with. If we will begin to build a building, God will finish the building. Oh, they praise the Lord. You know? Oh, they got so excited. You know? And, uh, and, and I, all we did was act by faith. And so Rohendo stands up and he says, Pastor, build it right here. I said, I said, right now, he said, yeah, he said, build, build it on the property right next door. Now, let me tell you what that meant. There was a hill next door. The building came right up to a hill. And that hill was twice as high as this room and a little bit bigger than this room, probably twice the size of this room. And I'm talking a hill made out of caliche, which is like rock, cement, you know, and rock. And, and he said, you build, it, you build it next door, which meant we had to tear that whole hill down, literally. And I, and I told the people, I said, if, if you will begin to do what God laid on your heart, then God will finish the building. I want you to know the very next day, they start showing up with pickaxes, buckets, and shovels. And months went by, and they leveled that entire hill. They're moving by faith. I drew up some plans for the building. Niceville is still there today. It's a beautiful church today. But I started drawing up some plans for it. And, and they're getting excited. They dug out the chain wall around it. And I didn't have a nickel to my name to build that building with. And now it's just within a week or two. They're ready. It's almost like, okay, we've done our part, preacher. What you going to do? You know? well, I couldn't have had an answer for that because I didn't have anything. And, and so, but they're building that building. And all of a sudden, when they're building that building, there was right before they finished the, the chain wall, so when they were digging out the foundation, right before they finished it, a lady and gentleman in our church invited us over to their house. And so we went over to their house to eat. She cooked my noodle, and we were eating. I didn't tell anybody we were there. There were no cell phones in those days. I did, there was no forwarding address. We're sitting in that home, eating. And the phone rings. He said, yeah. Well, yes. Matter of fact, yes, he is. <coughs> he said, Brother Charles, you have a phone call. I'm like, God, who knew I was here? And I went over there, and it was a businessman from about 800 miles away who I've never met in my life. And he said, Brother Charles, you're on the Mexican border? Yes. Are you doing anything across the border? Yes. Well, I'm a businessman, and I'm a Christian, and I, I want to help a missions work directly. He said, if I start sending you money every week, Will you build, will you do exactly what God told you to do? And he said, and not only that, if there's any extra, would you allow, uh, would you just put that wherever you want to? I said, well, yes, sir. And my jaw's dropping. I'm th you know what? He had called the church number, but it rang at that home. How can you figure that out? There's an operator in heaven. That's all I know. You know? But my God says it my heart. Oh, I tell the brethren in the church and the ladies and man they start building this church you know and we get the cement poured and everything's manual done by hand you know 
And they're just making all this progress. And man, we, now we got the cinder block walls up and it's looking good. And it's the first building in the entire area. And I want you to know people from all around would come in the evenings and just sit there and watch us watch them build it and stuff. This thing's progressing. And so we're having outdoor, indoor church in the building with an open roof, no windows and doors one night. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me again and said, stop building right now. Don't touch it. Buddy, I let the air out of the balloon when I said, listen, I don't understand this, but all this work and excitement going on, stop it right now. God told us to stop. Let's don't do anything until God does it again, until yeah. God tells us to yeah. do it again. So they quit building. And I want you to know, God knew what I didn't know. I didn't realize that I actually had like two congregations in one. And some of those that were so involved in the building actually were kind of thinking it meant they were going to have some kind of authority and stuff and, and you know, importance and things like that. So when we stopped building, these two factions started fighting. Actually, one side did. They were real ugly. And the other side was real sweet. And I just kind of stood back and said, my God, knew what he was doing. And I just kept trying to preach to him, teach him, love him. And all of a sudden, that ugly faction left. We lost half the church. Mama. And when that ugly faction left, the most sweet, beautiful spirit swept in there. Mm. And I mean, it was like heaven on earth. Yeah. And I was preaching one of the first services after they left. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me again and said, now begin the building and I'll finish it. So I told them. And my God, they shouted and worshiped. And the building started again the next day. And so we're, we're working on this building. And I, I get a phone call from Pasadena, Texas, from Wayne McLean. The only time Wayne McLean ever called me, sis. And, and the only time, you know. And I was scared. Because I thought, oh, oh, my God, the prophet's calling, you know? He <laughs> said, so, what's he going to answer? He said, Brother Charles, i got a question for you. I said, Brother McLean, I'll tell you the truth. I thought he was going to ask me, are you living in sin? Are you doing something wrong? You know? And I know. You know what he asked me? He said, Brother Charles, he said, the Holy Ghost told me to ask you a few questions. I said, okay. I said, Brother McLean, I'll tell you the truth, whatever it is. He said, are you doing anything in old Mexico? I said, yes, sir. Matter of fact, I am. I said, we're building a church. He said, tell me about it. So I told him about it. It was a pretty nice little project. And he said, now I'm going to ask you the second question. I want you to be honest with me. I said, uh, okay. He said, have you bought that property? Man, I wanted to crawl under a rock. Because we hadn't bought that property. This is strictly a work by faith. 100%. And pardon the language, my mama didn't raise no fool. You don't build on somebody else's property, especially in Mexico. And I said, Brother McLean, no. It's strictly by faith. Brother McLean's on the other side. Here's what he's doing. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. He starts speaking in tongues. He said, Brother Giles, God told me that you had not bought that property, and that's why I called. And now that you've told me the truth, I'm telling you what God told me to tell you, that if you'll buy that property, Apostolic Temple is going to buy that property for you. You make the deal, and we'll buy it. Hey, my God shall supply all. I said, can we buy it? He said, yes, we made a deal on the property. It was a, a lot of money for him and a, a good deal for us. But there was a problem. I could not buy the property. Rogelio told me, he said, he said, you're not able to buy here. You're going to have to have a Mexican partner. And, and, and it was right. You know, I didn't know the laws and stuff like that. And so, so I found out I really couldn't buy it. But we had made the deal. And, and, and I mean, and this has all happened within a few days now of Wayne McClain calling me. And so hey, we made the deal. And as we made the deal on the property, I'm trying to figure out how can I buy it now that I can buy it. And, uh, and my phone rang. And it was missionary, Mike Edge, my good buddy. And he came to Mexico after I came to Del Rio. And he calls me up. He said, Brother Charles, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? He said, I just, we want a businessman that's in the government to the Lord. And he's worked it out. He said, Brother Charles, I just got the United Pentecostal Church International legalized in Mexico. I said, what does that mean? He said, that means we can buy property. You know, we, we, we bought it, paid for it, and we put it in the organization's name. So the only way I could do it 
It was the first piece of property registered in, the, in Mexico in the name of the organization because my God's a wise master builder and he knows exactly the steps to follow. And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so we bought the property. And now we still, man, things are going so good. All of a sudden, we've got the cinder block walls finished. Everything's done. We 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 put the baptistry in. We have put an electrical pole up, you know, and wired the uh, we're for for wiring the building eventually. But we put the electrical pole up, even though there was no electricity in the area. We just did it by faith, you know. Yeah. And so, and and I mean, as this had the same week. That Mike Edge calls me and tells me we can get the property, and I'm buying the property. My phone rings again at the church. I answer it. It's a pastor from North Texas who I've never heard of, who I have never met. He said, Brother Charles, you're on the border? Yes, sir. You doing anything across the border? Yes, sir. He said, I've got a, about a dozen men that want to come, and they'd like to go to a mission service. Would you arrange it that we could do that? I said, yes, sir. And he said, can we have church with you in Del Rio, too? I said, yes, sir. And so it's just, we're, we're just having this conversation. I'm excited. He said, tell me about your building project. I said, I'm so excited. I told him all about it. I said, we're at the place now. We've got to put the roof on it and the upper structure and, and you know, sheetrock and wire it and all that kind of stuff. And he said, well, isn't that funny? He said, everybody that I'm bringing, every man, they do sheetrock, they do electrical, they do roofing, they're contractors. He said, that's why God had me call you. He said, if I send you a check to pay for it, would you get all the material on site and we'll come down there and while we're having revival, we'll build the rest of the church out for you. I said, yes, I want you to know we had a revival that weekend and they put the roof in it, the top on it. They put, they wired it for electricity. We had lighting. We had everything in. We didn't have electricity out there, but we had everything ready in here. Amen. Why? Because my God says so about all authority in the world and his riches and glory. the roof on it. So the next thing is windows and doors, which we had not done anything with yet. So we're going to put windows and doors on it. My phone rings. It, it was a Brother Edmondson from Beaumont, Texas, and he calls me up. Hey, Brother Charles. He was there the night I received the Holy Ghost. Hey, Brother Charles. He said, uh, guess what? I retired. I said, I'm so glad. Glad you retired, Brother Edmondson. He said, yeah. He said, uh, I'm going to travel around. I got me a little bit trailer. He said, I'm going to travel around and I'm going to do stuff for home missions, works and stuff. I can help them on some different things, you know, building and stuff like that. I said, that's beautiful, Brother Edmondson. Praise God. God's going to bless you. He said, is there anything I can do for you? I said, no, sir. I don't think so. I said, I've got the church in Del Rio all refurbished, looking great. And I said, uh, the only thing I've got is cross the border. He said, well, what's cross the border? I told him about it. And I said, the only thing we got to do now is we just have to put windows in it and doors in it. And I said, we're going to just build our own instead of, you know, buying them. We want to custom build them for the church. He said, well, Charles, you're not going to believe what I do. I said, what do you do? He said, well, I do custom windows and doors. He said, well, would you mind if I come and park my trailer in Del Rio and go across the border every day and I'll build the windows and doors in for you? Amen. You see how God just does these things by layers? And so Brother Edmondson is there. He's doing this while this next call comes in. And this call came from New Valley, Texas. And, and the pastor there was a home missions church. And Brother Vaughn and Brother Vaughn, we were good friends. And he calls me up, you know, and he says, Brother Charles, he said, I'm, I'm just going to have to to give up my church. I said, oh, Brother Vaughn, no. He said, yeah. He said, I'm having bad heart trouble. I've got to move to an area with better heart care. And the doctor said, if I don't, I'm not going to live long. And he said, man, I, and so we talked like that. And I was heartbroken for him, you know. And he said, but I called you, Brother Charles. He said, I, I don't even know why I called you other than the Lord put it in my heart. I said, what is it, Brother Vaughn? I thought he was going to ask for help, advice, you know. He said, uh, Brother Charles, he said, uh, I've been to your church in Del Rio. you got a beautiful church now. I said, yes, sir, thank you. He said, you don't need no pews or nothing like that. I said, no, sir, no, sir. He said, man, i got a whole church full of brand new pews, a new pulpit, altars. And he said, God told me to call you. Would you want those pews and altars and pulpit? I said, brother, you're not going to believe it. I said, 
I've got a brand new church in Mexico. We're just now finishing it, but if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to take them across the border. Oh, yeah. So, man, I rented a U-Haul truck. I feel, and there, there wasn't room for one more piece of furniture by the time I filled that thing up. And I'm on my way back to Del Rio with a church full of brand new pews and altars, right. poor pit, right. you know. Right. And and I so I get to the Mexican border and I'm going to border cross them, you know. So I go in and I talk to the Atuana, you know. Back then it was the old green shirted mean guys, you know. And I go in to talk to this fellow. And uh, he turned out to be the devil in flesh, you know. And, and I, I, I got there early in the morning, and I stayed there all day long. He was mean to me. Because all I needed was one signature on this piece of paper, and I can drive them in. And I told him, I said, look, these are donated. It's for the work of God. It's to bless the people. Nobody's uh -huh. making money on it, you know. Right. And, uh, and that, made, that man made me sit in that chair all day long. And if I would get up to come ask him something, sit down. That's what he did. Sit down. And I'd sit down, you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, I mean, you know, it, it was 11 p.m. I'm not making it up. I'm desperate. I'm sitting there, man. I'm having a spiritual attack. And, and I'm thinking, God, I got a truck sitting out there. And I got to pay rent on that truck every day. And he's not letting me cross. And the bad thing was, there was no business going on. Every now and then, somebody would come in. But he's sitting there with one piece of paper on his desk. And all I needed was to sign it. And I'm too dumb, stupid, I started saying stupid, but I'm too dumb to figure out what he wanted from me was a bunch of more deeds, a lot, a lot of money, you know? And, and so when I'm sitting there and I'm over, so I didn't, I didn't pay him any money, any private money. I'm just sitting over there praying to myself. I couldn't pray loud because every time he'd start hearing me, he'd say, be quiet. So it's either sit down or be quiet. That's all I'd hear from him all day long. And I'm about desperate. And I'm praying that it's about 11 o'clock. I know he's going to go home pretty soon. And I'm sitting there and I said, God, you've got to help me. I, I, this is spiritual, God. You got to help. All of a sudden, this, uh, this Mexican gentleman comes in, big guy, had a dark mustache and black hair, handsome fella. And he comes, well, I'm sitting over here, and he just comes walking in the door, walks by me, don't even acknowledge me. Gets almost over here to the Tawana, and he turns around, looks at me, walks over to me, shakes my hand. Never said a word to me. Shakes my hand. Goes over here to this Tawana, you know, and they start talking quietly one to another. Go ahead and shake my hand. That's all right. It's a, it, they start talking quietly, and all of a sudden, he turns around, and he starts to walk out the door. And but before he did, though, Shaking, he's over with Antoine. He pulls out a wad of cash and he thumbs out a whole bunch of bills. He gives them to the Antoine. And then he starts to walk out the door and he, then he stops and he walks over to me and he shakes my hand. Never said a word. I'm looking at that guy like, what just happened? He hadn't said one word to me. He whispered to the Antoine, gave him a bunch of money. And the moment he walked out the door, my best friend, my buddy, my pal, my Tawana buddy over here. <laughs> no, amigo. Oh, he was all smiles. He signed my paper. Praise God. I want you to know, when we put those pews and pulpit and altars in the church, they were like custom made. It was the exact fit. Amen. Because my God shall supply all of your need. I'm trying to build somebody's faith. church deal. Eventually we got the electricity and, and, and God began to move and miracles and like you wouldn't believe began to happen and and just on and on and on and, and God was pouring out the spirit but all of a sudden uh, my PA system went out in Del Rio and, uh, and I had scheduled my first traveling revival since I had went there and I was going to go to Marshall, Texas and Greenville, Texas, and one other city, and preached for three locations in a week. And so uh, I left. And before we left, though, I began to pray. And I told the church, I said, uh, I said, church, I said, we need a PA system. I said, let's pray that God will make a way for one. And when I get back, maybe we'll have the money to be able to buy one or something like that. So we're praying. And as we're praying, before I took this trip, tongues interpretation came. And the Lord said, my son, I will provide for you that which you have asked for. So I told the church, I said, oh my God, I don't know how. But on this trip, I'm going to come back with a PA system. I'm not a beggar. I'm not a, I'm a giver. I'm not a beggar. But I went on this trip. I drove all day long from 
Del Rio, Texas to Marshall, Texas. I mean, it took about 12 hours, I think, to get there. I showed up at the church within an hour before I'm supposed to preach. I've never been there before. I go into the pastor's office. We're talking before church. And, and he says, uh, well, Charles, you ready to go in and have church? I said, yes, sir. And so he leaves his office, and we walk down a long hall, but longer than from here to that back wall back there. We walk down this long hall to go toward the sanctuary. And as we walk in, I'm looking, and there is a beautiful PA system sitting right there. I mean, I mean, nice, new looking, you know. And I'm, I'm, he's walking out, and I'm, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he stops. He turns around. He comes back. He says, hey, hey, we just put a new PA system in the church. He said, you wouldn't need a new PA system, would you? I said, oh, yeah, I need a new PA system. So I had a station wagon. So I left with a brand new looking PA system in my back. It was nicer than ours that it went out. So I'm just like, praise God. God did what he said he would do. So I drive to Greenville, Texas to preach with Scott McManus, who uh, he just happened to be in the parking lot of the church when I drove up. And he waves at me, and he comes over, and, and we're hugging and shaking hands. And, and he says, I'm so glad to have you here, Brother Charles. And we're talking there, and he looks over to my station wagon. He said, what you got back there? I said, I got a PA system. He said, can I see that thing? I opened up the back of it. He looks in there, and he says, he's moving it around. He said, man, that's interesting. I'm going to show you something. We go over into his office. I'm not joking. On the floor was the exact same PA system. The only thing different was the serial number. Same PA system, same speakers, same everything. And he looks at me and said, you don't need two of them, do you? I said, you don't mind if I put one in Mexico, do you? He said, no. So I didn't come back with one. I come back with two. We put it in the church in Mexico. Why? Because my God says a power. According to his riches and glory. Work with God, friends. Wow. So much more began to happen, just infinite things one after the other. We, when I moved there, we inherited some situations, what not from Brother Miller, but from the past. There was a huge balloon note that somehow somebody had never paid, and now I'm the new pastor in town with everything but money in our border church, and this balloon note's coming up in exactly 30 days. And on Sunday night, I told the church, I said, church, here's our situation. I told them exactly what it was. I said, there's no earthly way we can pay this. But I said, I tell you what, if we will trust the Lord, God will make a way. And let's just do everything we can do. So we start praying about it. First time, tongues interpretation comes. And the Lord said to me that uh, these, these exact words, and the Lord said, uh, my son, I shall supply all of your need. Ask of me. And I thought, oh my God. So we began to tell the Lord, Lord, we need to pay off this balloon. Note. So I told the church, I said, church, I'm, we're going to work hard. We're going to do everything we can do. And if there's any gap left, God somehow, I don't know how he'll make it up. But I said, because of what God just spoke, Unless he tells me differently, I'm not going to go to a bank. I'm not going to seek a loan. I'm not going to call one preacher. I'm not going to ask for one handout. God said it. Let's believe it. Right. That's what we did. Right. So we did everything. My wife and I drained our bank account, which was very small. We did everything we could. We sacrificed. We worked everything we could do. Finally, it was the night before. In every service, we would leave, and we would thank God for supplying our need. And finally, on Sunday night, I left church. And went home because I had to pay that balloon note by noon the next day. And so I, I went to, I went home that night and I was kind of anxious and I didn't sleep really well. So I got up early in the morning. I go down to the church. I've got to meet this balloon note for our honor's sake. And I'm just, they may be able to work something out with me. I don't know. But I sit down in my office and after prayer, I went through the books and things. And, and I, I said, Lord, it wasn't a matter of priority. I'm going to do my bills and stuff first, get that little stuff out of the way, because I need to really focus on the church. When I finish, folks, and I'm not saying this out of any shame or humility, when I finished, just my little portion there, I had exactly savings, checking, anything. I had exactly $10 to my name. And I, I promised before Almighty God, I took out a sheet of typing paper, and I wrote... $10. And I put it in front of me and I said, Lord, 
I've only got one thing to say to you. You shall supply all my need. I praise you for it. And as I'm speaking it, the Lord spoke into my mind, check a coat pocket. And I'm kind of a neat freak, but I left a coat hanging in the closet in the, in the office because I married a couple a week or two before that. And, uh, you know, nothing given. I just did it. They came to church. And so I went over and I checked the pocket of that coat. And I reached in and I felt a piece of paper and I pulled it out. It was a $100 bill. Oh, yeah, I checked the rest of the pockets. No, they ain't got there. <laughs> and, man, I began to praise the Lord because I'd rather have $100, $110 than $10 sure. every week, you know? Sure. But, but my God supplied our need. And yeah. so then I began to work on the church. And, and I promised, and then I, I, I did everything I could do, drained everything. And we were $980 short of the balloon notes. Nine o'clock in the morning. We're $980 short. You might say, well, that's not much. Hey, it might as well have been a million. We didn't have it, you know. And so you know what I did? I took another sheet of typing paper, and I wrote real big, $980 on it. I put it right in front of me, and I said, Lord, I've only got one thing to say. You, you know, you shall supply all of our need according to your riches and glory. And I cried. As I'm still speaking, that first sentence, I heard a loud noise at the front door. And I recognized that the mail slot, that a bunch of stuff had just been dropped on the floor. So I jumped up, and when I did, the Holy Ghost hit me, and I began to try to say I'm in the midst of a miracle, don't even know what it is, but I couldn't speak English. I ran downstairs, I ran in there, there's mail all on the floor, and I'm thinking, oh my God, there's a miracle here, there's a miracle here, because of what I was feeling. And I picked up all that mail, and, and, and there was nothing there but just junk mail and a few little piddling normal bills. There's no miracle in it, you know. But I put it all in my hand, and I began to wave it before the Lord. And I said, God, you shall supply all of our need. You have all I need. I have all I need. I praise you for it. And as I'm doing that, I saw something stuck on the back of one of the envelopes. And it was a notification for a certified letter. So I dropped the mail and I pushed the front door open. And the mailman was driving away from the business across the street. And I waved at him. He pulls up and he says, uh, he, he says, I'm sorry. He said, I didn't know anyone was here. Uh, he said, I don't normally run this. I see our mail normally come about 3 p.m. in the evening. It's 9 a.m. in the morning. He said, this is the first time I've ever ran this route. And I run it backwards from the other guy. I hope I didn't mess you up. I'm shaking as I'm saying it. No, sir. I think you're right on time. <laughs> I took that in there. When I hit the door, I hit the door running. I began to praise God. I went loud. But I didn't even open it yet. And I went lap after lap around the sanctuary saying, God, you have all I need. I have all I need. I praise you for it. I finally tore it open. It was from Orange Savings, Orange, Texas, who I have no knowledge of and know nobody there. And I opened that up. And there's a letter that's burned in my brain to this day. And this is what it said. Dear Brother Childs, this is for whatever God has told you. If it is late then blame me, not God. I have procrastinated and been late with this. Use it for whatever God told you. The only thing I ever ask you is don't tell anybody my name. And there was a cashier's check, means I can use it right now, for exactly $1,000. Amen. Now, that might not be big to you. I needed $980. I didn't need a million dollars. But my God was on time. My God never fails. My God comes through. Praise God. So I started working across the border, Del Rio, Texas. Uh, it was a border town, and God gave me an amazing job. After about four years, I figured out my kids like to eat, so I went back to work. And so I, I got an amazing job. As an engineer in uh, Maquila Gore, and then after that began to get promoted. It came over several divisions, but I was I was still kind of early there, and we're going through all kinds of stuff, you know. And about that time, this is right after I started work. My wife and I had uh, we want we were going to buy a house, and um, and the Lord laid a whole home in downtown Del Rio, Central Del Rio, in the old money section, a big old home with a guest home. But it was a total rebuild. It had been abandoned for seven years. Forty-something trees in the yard, half of them in the yard, literally. 
And um, it was a nightmare. But that's where God really laid on our heart. So it took me a year and three months to buy it because of legal problems and issues. I told the church every detail about it, you know. And we finally got it. And I'm thinking, how am I going to rebuild this thing? And I had to do all the plans and details for the draws and all that kind of stuff. And I did all of that. And I want you to know, I just bought this house. I'm trying to figure out how am I going to accomplish this, this thing and, and work across the board and pastor several churches, you know. And, and all of a sudden, we've been targeted by Satanists, big time. I mean, bad targeting. They they let us know they're going to kill us. They threatened us, terrorists, phone house, calls. It went. It was much worse. I won't even get into it. But um, if God hadn't prevented it, then they would have killed us. And uh, because of the move of God that we were having. And so, I want you to know, I bought that house. I'm trying to figure out how we're going to do this. And two weeks after I bought that house, satan satanic people broke into our church on a revival weekend we were having and they gra graffiti all over the church Satan rules, Satan is God, that kind of junk turned the cross upside down in the church that we had and burned our church down. They took everything in my office all my notes, all my Bibles, books, everything everything I had, they tore it all up piled it on my desk and started a fire and then went in and played instruments while the church began to burn. And so now we're, we're, I'm, I'm trying to rebuild this home that I didn't know I could even do it anyway now I've got a church to rebuild, and the church in crisis, you know. And, uh, man, it just went downhill from there because some of the people got mad at God because it happened, and we lost over half the church and most of the giving and everything. And, man, it just went well. We, we had no debt before this happened. My wife and I came out of this with almost $80,000 in personal credit card debt. And, and, I mean, it was it was just good Lord. Can anything else happen? We averaged 22 hours days, my wife and I, for a year. Almost killed ourselves, literally. Uh, long story short, it just went down here. Well, the city of Del Rio had just hired a new building inspector. First time ever that they'd hired someone out from outside. They brought this guy in from Los Angeles. And not Del Rio's not Los Angeles. They brought him in from Los Angeles, and he brought his attitude with him. And I thought, man, why is this guy persecuting me? Because he was making me do all kinds of things that I knew we didn't have to do. And, and no matter how we try to justify it, he made us do it. And I had to comply. He's the building inspector. And uh, the first time I went to his office, I figured it out. And I'm not kicking nobody, but he was a very devout Jehovah's Witness. And his office was wallpapered with it. And I finally figured out he's just religious persecuting me, you know. And so... Man, we went back and forth, back and forth, and and uh, finally, it's it's time now. We finally miraculously got through this building. Pro and all I need now is an occupancy permit. That's all I need. He comes up here, and everything's done. There's nothing left to do. And this guy's just me and him at the church, you know, and he's walking around. He says, oh, Reverend, I didn't think he's going to be able to do it. No, I didn't either. He said, man, you go, you pulled everything off. I said, yes, sir. I said, you made it tough on me, buddy, but, you know, we did it. You know, <coughs> And he said, I've been waiting for this day. I have been waiting for this day. <laughs> oh, he starts belly laughing. I thought, what's so funny? He said, I got you, preacher. I got you. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm not going to give you an occupancy permit. I said, you've got to. He said, no, no, I've been waiting for this. He said, I've been waiting and waiting. He said, you've expanded your building so much, you don't have enough parking space. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll get permission from the people across the street, several businesses, and, and, and all. He said, no, no, no. He said, I'll fight you in court. He knew we were broke. He knew we were broke. He said, I'll fight you in court. He said, I got a bigger budget than you. He was like that. I'm going to destroy you and this church. And he walked out of my building like this. Got in this car, and I want, if I ever wanted to not be a preacher for a few minutes, you know, I'm as human as you are, you know, and, uh, and I thought, oh my God, oh my God, and so I did what I didn't want to do. Every year since I've been in Del Rio, pronounced from 1986 to 1992, I'd call Mr. C.E. Queen, Dallas, Texas. He owned two lots on the other side of the block, and those lots were vacant, cleared, except they'd let the grass grow up about that high. And every year I'd call him, nice guy, and he'd say, Mr. Child, uh, Pastor Child, he said, look, I like you. I'm sympathetic to the church. He said, I'll never sell those, those lots. He said, I don't get rid of properties. I keep property. 
copies. And he said, it's just me. They'll never be sold. So after the building inspector did what he did, I called Mr. Queen. And he knew what I was calling for. <laughs> hey, Pastor, I've been waiting on your annual call. I knew what you're calling for. And uh, we talked a little bit. He said, Pastor, you know what I answer for you. Ask it. I'll never, I'll never sell those lots. I said, Mr. Queen, I understand that. But let me tell you what happened. He said, okay. And I told him the story, exactly the way it happened. He said, that man did what? I said, yeah, he did that. Uh, he said, I can't, well, he, I can't repeat everything he said, but he said, you know? I said, yes, sir, Mr. Queen, he did. I said, I said, listen, if you can ever be in a position to take advantage of somebody, I don't know what we can do, but I'll come up, I'll somehow find a way to meet your price. Take advantage of me if you have to. We're desperate. We got to do this. He said, Pastor, I'll tell you one more time, and I'm firm. I will never sell that property. I never told you that I wouldn't give it to you. He said, I'm mad oh, at that city. I'm mad at that city. He said, because they cut that property that I was going to get cut, and they cut that grass and charged me $850. Oh. And I have refused to pay taxes the last couple of years because I'm mad at them. He said, it's not that much if you'll clear that off and, you know, pay that off. I'll give you the property. We did immediately. I went down to the city and I got permission for overflow parking. And I walked back into the city inspector's office. And he was in there by himself. He looks up from his desk. Hey, Reverend, what you doing here? Surprised to see you. I said, yes, sir. I said, how you doing today? I said, I just come from my occupancy permit. He looked up at me, just me and him in the office. He said, Reverend, you made my day because you're not going to get it. I said, oh, yes, I am. And I slapped that occupancy with that permit down there for him to sign. And I showed him the deed for the property. And he looked at me and he said, my God, how did you do that? I said, sign it, sir. My God is bigger than your God. And you know what? I, when I walked out, I got up here and said, when I walked out, I walked out with that deed, that uh, permit in my hand, and I'm going like this. <laughs> Six big guy want me to take his place. He said, I want you to be my successor. I'm going to do something else. We agreed. That let me have an office in Del Rio. And so everything was fine until I took the job. And he started riding me like you wouldn't believe. And I figured, found out he was completely demon possessed. And he this is all while we're trying to do the building program and build the house. And my wife had lost her job and we lost most of the church and we're going under. I had to have my job. And this guy kept trying to fire me but he couldn't find a reason to fire me. He kept putting stuff, false accusations in my personnel file because he was going to build them up, build them up and one day fire me. But he couldn't fire me because I wasn't doing anything wrong. And one day, one day, I woke up, well, one night, I woke up about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I thought I was having a massive heart attack. Never had that kind of trouble before. Felt like an elephant standing on my chest, pushing me through the bed. I told my wife, I said, Monica, keep me to the hospital, I'm having a heart attack. They rushed me to the hospital. They hooked me up on all these sensors, monitoring me. <laughs> that morning, on the corporate jet from corporate. The president of the company and the vice president in charge of engineering flew all the way to Del Rio, Texas to call me into a meeting and fire me because of false accusations. Jesus. 
The only reason I didn't get fired Jesus. was because God was good enough to put me in the hospital. Jesus. And he shows up and he asks my boss, he said, what the world did you do to Fred? <laughs> so they flew back off, you know, because I wasn't there to fire. They weren't going to come to the hospital and fire me. I got out of the hospital. I didn't have a heart attack. It was kind of the beginning of an ulcer. Simulated a heart attack. And I get out. And when I went back to work, a couple days later, I called the president of the company. He said, hey, Fred. I said, hey, buddy. I said, uh, I said, uh, I know you came to see me. I said, I'm requesting a meeting with you. He said, yeah. I said, I need to meet with you too. And I knew what he needed to meet with me for. He was going to fire me. Because of my boss. And uh, But my boss was now in Germany for three weeks. And so I said, yes, sir. I said, it's very important. I need to meet with you face to face. He said, I'll fly back down. That's how important it was to him. He's flying down to fire me. Brought the head of engineering again. They come in there, and he says, Fred, before I tell you what I'm fixed to tell you, he didn't know I knew. He said, before I tell you what I'm fixed to tell you, go ahead and tell me why you want to have this meeting. I said, yes, sir. I said, I'm not trying to pick on nobody. I said, I've done everything right. I said, I know that my personnel file has been loaded. I said, there's not one thing in that file that's true. I said, but I have documentation that can prove I've got four areas that I can sue this company for. And I said, I don't want to. I have nothing against this company. But I said, I'm not wanting to sue, and that's not what I brought you here for. I said, I want you to look and say, I'm, I'm not the dumbest tool in the shed. Yeah. I had a stack of documentation like that that my boss had done that was real, that was wrong. I said, all I want you to do is, is just look at this documentation, this proof. He took that stack of paper, and I'll never forget it. He looked at me and said, you want me to read all of this? I said, yes, sir, if you don't mind. He started putting, boy, he went like. Let me tell you what God did. I didn't get fired that day. I got promoted because I walked out of that office with my boss's job, and he got demoted and put over into another area where he couldn't hurt nobody. They didn't fire him. But why did God do that? Because my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Why don't we all clap our hands for the Lord? We give God the praise and worship him. So I will wrap it up because I could talk for days on this one, but I'm going to wrap up this chapter with a story that several of you are familiar with. Got lots of stories like this because I can tell you times that a woman uh, and her mother screamed at me from the other side of the H-E-B parking lot, embarrassed me to death because they come up to me with tears and mascara running and short shorts and hawk the top, and three little kids with them and hollering at me and calling my name. And I'm thinking, my God, I don't even know these ladies, only to find out that the young one, Shirley, had terminal AIDS, had been put out of the hospital because she had a little bit of a of a better period. They said, you go home, get your paperwork, get your house in order, you're fixing to die. Never heard of nobody being healed of AIDS before. And I want you to know that God, she came to church that night. We baptized her. God healed her AIDS. She was declared free of it. I could tell you stories like that all day long. But I'm going to tell you this story that several of you already might know, but the rest of you don't. And it's the story of how God can save a church from an unethical preacher. We were just finishing the church in Mexico, the first one. We built many. We were building this first church, and I love the Mexican people. I love the Latin culture. There's nothing in me that doesn't love them. I wouldn't have spent 13 years down there if I didn't, and nine, nine years with my office there, okay? I love them. I have many sons and daughters there today. Amen. And, uh, but we're finishing the first church, and about three months, but right before we put the roof on, because those guys came and put, and before we put the windows and the doors on, but we had the walls up, they, there was this old dog, a 90-pound black dog, came to our church. And some of you know, so on and that. <laughs> Amen. And this dog stopped and parked himself right there at the double doors of the church. And, uh, I mean, day or night, for three or four months, that dog was always there. 
I told the people, I said, he's more faithful to the church than most of the people are. He was there every day. He's always the first one to church, last one to leave. He wouldn't leave. And, and if you went to church, I'm telling you, during service and everything, if you wanted to get in, he's laying there. He was like the doorkeeper to the house of God. And you had to go, shoot, shoot. And he would move out of the way till you walked through, and he would lay right back down there. This happened for three to four months. People started feeding him, you know, they're bringing food to him, and uh, tacos, burritos, Mexican dog, you know, so, and, and a healthy looking dog, you know, and, uh, and during, during all these months, I'm telling you the truth, during all these months, that dog never nipped, he never barked at nobody, he never growled, I mean, he was a big pet to the whole church, you know, and, and literally, he became like a church member, because he, he was there just like everybody else was, and so, so finally, we're finishing up the church. And uh, I had been warned by multiple preachers. I had been warned that the border culture is unique. It's not like Mexico, and it's not like the U.S. On both sides of the border. It's the border, the frontera, and it's, it's, a, it's a unique world. They said one of the things that happens here all the time is somebody like me, an outsider, comes in, builds a church, and gets everything going, and there are certain preachers that watch from afar, and they wait until you finish it. And then they try to sweep in and, and steal the church. You know, we have unethics here in our sure. country. They have unethics there. That's the way it works. And so, so here we are, you know, four months or so into this dog being there. And, and um, one night, I'm, I'm starting to, I'm fixing to preach. They're singing the last chorus. And a note comes up to me. And here's what it said in Spanish. Dear Pastor, God has sent me here tonight to preach to this church. And he signed it. And I looked up to see who God had sent. And there was a really handsome looking man standing in the back door. Black suit, black tie, white shirt, black hair, black mustache, holding his Bible. And he's looking at me. And I felt the hatred all the way from back there. I discerned the spirit from back there. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is him. This is the guy that's coming to steal the church. You know? And, and, uh, and so I just flipped the note over and Send him a note back. And I said, dear brother so-and-so, I'm glad God sent you here. Hang around. If God tells me to let you preach, I'll let you preach. Buddy, I preached my head off that guy. <laughs> he heard the gospel at least once. I'll say that. Now, he didn't get in that pulpit because I knew what he was there for. And I was going to talk to him. I wasn't afraid to talk to him. I was going to go address him firmly if that's what it took. But I couldn't get to him because the altar service after service was so packed up here in the front the way they would do it. I couldn't, and I looked back there, and he was in the back of the church, literally, with his Bible like this, and he goes, <sighs> he was so mad at me, you know, you could feel the devil all the way from back there, you know? Anyway, nothing happened. Nothing happened. The next service was the first service that I think I had missed church there. And I had always told him, I said, look, if ever I can't get here, anything could happen between here and there. I don't have cell phones. You don't have phones. I said, Cornelio, four foot ten. He's pastor there now. I said, Cornelio, I said, listen, you're not ready to preach yet. Don't try. Don't feel the pressure. Just sing some courses. Praise the Lord. Take up an offering if you want to. Take up some te let testimonies come. Sure. Pray for the sick. Have a good time. Laugh. Go home and enjoy it. And I'll be back maybe the next service, you know. And so the next service I missed. And Cornelio is up here. There were all the churches there. Cornelio's there. We got this new building, and Cornelio's singing this chorus. And, and all of a sudden, that preacher comes up to the back door again, bold. And he comes up to that back door. And they said he starts looking around. And I mean, when I showed up at church, the next service there, the, the, the whole church comes out and meets me to tell me this story. And, and, and it's, it's amazing what happened. This preacher comes to the back door, and he looks around. And Cornelio said, I think he was looking for you when he didn't see you. He said, I just kept on singing choruses. And he said, when he didn't see you, he came down the back of the church and came down the side of the church. He said, I'm up here singing choruses, leading the people. He said, the preacher came right up to the pulpit, walked to the pulpit, puts his Bible on the pulpit, and holds on to the pulpit and just starts looking at the congregation. I said, what did y'all say? What did you, nada, nothing, nothing. I said, nobody said anything? No, Cornelio, you didn't say nothing? No, nothing. Nobody said anything? No, nobody said nothing. I said, well, what happened? You know? And they said, well, he got in that pulpit. And Cornelio said, well, when I finished, of course, he said, uh, the other night, <laughs> this is kind of funny, 
God sent me here to preach to this church. But that gringo pastor of yours wouldn't let me preach. And you know, when you say it like you have to insult, you know, so he gets up there and be like me coming here and insulting Brother Ratley. You don't, you don't do that, you know? Yeah. And so he, he insulted me and said, but God sent me here again tonight to preach to this church. And before I preach, I have a message from God for this church. Here's the message that God wants you to hear. God doesn't want you to have a gringo pastor. God wants you to have a Mexican pastor. And I've come to introduce myself to you. I am your new pastor. I am Brother So and So. And they're sitting there like, I said, What did y'all say? What did y'all say? <laughs> Nobody said nothing. I said, Oh my God. I said, What happened? They said, Well, he started to open his Bible. So now I'm going to preach to you my first message as your new pastor now. And I'm about to die. And I said, nobody said nothing. No. Well, yeah. Finally, somebody opened, something opened their mind. I said, who? He said, Negro, that, that dog, that black dog. <laughs> I said, this is too good to make up. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no. I said, what happened? They said, well, when the preacher said he's supposed to preach as he's opening his Bible, before he said his first word, Negro came charging through the door, growling and snarling. Big old white teeth, ninety pound black dog. They said he went down the back of the church just like the preacher did, and he came down the side just like the preacher did. And the preacher standing here watching him, and the dog came up on the platform just like the preacher did and attacked the preacher in the pulpit. I said, "You're kidding me!" I said, "What happened?" They said, "It was the best fight you've ever seen." They said that preacher fought with everything he had. The dog was fighting, and the dog was a better fighter than the preacher. And the preacher started to bleed. And the preacher takes his Bible and he's trying to beat the dog. And pages are flying. I said, "What else happened?" They said, "Finally, the preacher starts screaming, and he leaves the pulpit, and the dog leaves the pulpit with him. Goes down the side, and goes down the back, and leaves the." Door. I said, what were y'all doing? They said, we were cheering for a dog. This is God's truth. We were cheering for the dog. Now you have to see this. When you leave the front double doors of that church, there was a <laughs> hundreds of feet, I'll say that, of little road with cardboard houses on each side probably 25 houses on each side before you got to the road T. And at the road T, then it went up a high hill. It was a road so rough that if you didn't have a four-wheel drive vehicle, you couldn't navigate it. So the people in those homes, they would sit out there at night because one or two room little homes. So their main activity was sitting outside, talking, fellowshipping, eating, drinking, <laughs> And on service nights, they'd sit out there and listen to us. Didn't mean they came, but they would listen, and they'd listen to the music. And so when this preacher exits the church, and the dogs exiting with him, they were already all at attention because they had heard what was going on in here, and they heard the people cheering for the dog. And so the preacher and the dog exit, and the people in the church exit behind the preacher and the dog, and the people in the church are all saying, you know, something like, get it, get it, get it. And they say, this preacher's going down the road, and the dog's just chewing him up, and the people in the houses are all clapping and cheering. And go, dog, go, dog. I'm not making this up. And he gets down to the hill, and he goes up the hill. They said he was clawing and fighting and dragging, trying to get over the hill. And we got to the top of the hill. They said the preacher made it over the top and the dog was still biting on him when he went over the top. We never saw that dog again. Never did again. I still wonder if he was a dog or an angel of the Lord on assignment. But I know one thing. We never saw that preacher again. Surprise, surprise. Never saw him again. But I told the church when I told them this at another meeting, I said, it's amazing how when a dog knows how to come to church and use his mouth for the glory of God, we don't have any excuse my friend. Amen. So I'm going to tell you so much more. But I will tell you this. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory.
important. Yes. Thank you, God. So if there's anybody here that needs an encouragement from the Lord, needs God to meet a need, spoken or unspoken, come through in a circumstance, all I can tell you is commit thy ways unto the Lord. Yes. Do what God has told you to do. And if you haven't heard from him yet, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And when he tells you, even if it makes no sense at all. Speak, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. And then do what God says. And you will never be sorry. My God. Amen. Have I had hurts? Yes. Have I had great disappointments? Yes. My God. But I've never seen God clear. Never. I close with this, and I think I told people that same thing. While I was in my darkest days in Del Rio, I went and preached a long revival. Got an amazing offering. And we so needed it. We got up early on Saturday morning to go to San Antonio to go to a youth explosion. I'll tell the story very briefly, and I won't tell all the details. My wife and children are sleeping in the car. We're exhausted. I've been preaching all week. But I've taken them to a youth explosion at 10 o'clock Saturday morning, San Antonio. About 750 or so young people, plus adults and chaperones and pastors. And this revival was going to help my wife and family and I get over a dark time financially during the old year. And on the way there in the car by myself, because they're all asleep, the Holy Ghost spoke to me so clearly. When you get there, they're going to ask you to take up the offering. And when you do, give everything you've got. I said, God, I've already done it. I've already gave up career. I've already gave up our families, yeah, our loved ones. Hear it. I've already suffered more. Jesus. Give everything you've got. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Jesus. I cried. Didn't dare wake my wife up and tell her. Get there. Drive up to Castle Hills. Mike Chance walks out the host. <laughs> Pastor Charles, so glad to see you, Brother Charles. Hey, God laid it on my heart to ask you if you'd take up an offering. I'm not an offering taker. I said, yes, sir. God talked to me on the way here. I'll do it. Said, oh, by the way, we need three times the size offering we were going to get. We've had so many. It's twisting my arm. Yes, sir. I'll just do what God tells me to say. Man, they had a great choir. They had a great preacher. We had a great experience. All these kids are excited. He calls me up to take up an offering. And I got up and told what had happened that morning. I looked at my beautiful wife, my three little babies sitting over there. I said, honey, if you got any, I, I pulled out my wallet. I took every dollar I had in and out, $58 it was. I pulled $58 out and put it in the Jesus. I said, honey, would you open your purse and take every dollar, every penny, every coin you've got? Would you put it in the offering, please? And immediately she started doing it. She's amazing. As she was doing that, I said, hey, would you open our checkbook? Would you check the balance? And would you drain everything in our checkbook and savings account. And she did it. Everybody's looking at me like I fell off a tree. And I said, in that check that we needed so bad that I got last night for that revival, would you mind turning it over and endorsing it and putting it in the offering? Immediately, she grabbed that check and endorsed it and put it in the offering. She's got as, more faith, as much faith at least that I got. And here's the way I took up the offering. I was crying like a baby then. And I said, I don't care what y'all do. And I just fell on the floor and started squalling. You know what they did? They all fell on the floor. Hundreds of people started squalling. Took up the offering. Preacher preached, more singing, altar service, amazing service. And afterwards, everybody comes up to me and hugs on me. It's like I preached the whole message. Never seen something like that in my life. I hadn't either. <laughs> I'm broke. I'm humbled. I've given all. i got to make this short. We, Brother Chance comes up to me. Brother Charles, I'd like to take you and your family to the restaurant with us. I'm going to feed the speakers and stuff. Would you mind going? He said, by the way, we got the biggest offering we've ever received. I thought, well, that's good. I'm broke, but that's good. <laughs> we went to a really nice restaurant and he paid for it. He leans over to me. 
at the restaurant. He said, oh, child, I don't mean to embarrass you, but would you mind following me? God told me after we leave here, I was supposed to fill your gas tank up. I wanted to cry because I didn't have enough gas to get home. 165 miles from where we had to go. I didn't have enough gas in the car. I didn't have any credit cards. We'd already cut them all up. So we're driving home, and I get to Castroville, Texas. There's a high hill. And we're going up that hill, and I remember I got my coat on. And I did what you're not supposed to do. I said, honey, would you hold the steering wheel while I take the coat off to unbuckle my seatbelt? I'm trying to get this coat off. I mean, it's awkward, you know, in the car. And all of a sudden, I stuck my hand in the pocket. I pulled out a wad of cash to fill my whole hand. And I had to wreck the car. And I just dumped it in my wife's lap. Yeah, I did. I stuck my hand in that pocket. I pulled out a wad of cash. Every pocket was stuffed with cash. I don't know how it got there. People hugged me, but you'd feel somebody going in and out of your pockets. I never felt the thing. I'm about to wreck the car. Monica's over here counting money. We can call her and check this out. We had exactly 10 times the amount of money that we had just given all. My God. My God. Shall supply all of your needs according to his riches. Live for God. Serve him. If he blesses you, praise him. If he sacrifices, yes. praise him. Yes. But in all things, give thanks. Yes. For my God yes. shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory my by God. Christ Jesus. My God. I end it this way. If God's ever done anything for you, uh -huh. anything, anything, I want you to give him the honor of praising him for it right now. And if you want to come to an altar, give God praise. Praise Him. And if you need the Holy Ghost, come, believe Him, repent, and praise Him. And begin to receive the Holy Ghost. Why don't we leave this service with a joyful praise in our heart? Praise Him for the revival that's breaking out in this church that you're going to be a part of. Give God Amen. Let everybody that has bread praise the Lord. God bless you.
I don't want to go to the doctor. But I left this place that morning saying that if you don't do something, I'm fixed to not be here anymore. I knew I, I knew it was going to be. And in fact, I just a couple weeks earlier got my wife calling you. That day. Yeah, that day we went and signed our wills because I wanted that canopy idea. You know? So I walked out of this place, went with my wife, Susan. When it, until we signed our will, we went home. I stepped into my house. A lady that I pastored for 15 years, Sister Cooper, never been in the hospital a day in her life that I knew, remember. <clears throat> got a call. She was not in her 90s. Got a call and, and uh, they said that she was in the ER. John called her. Uh, her put her back her hips. Ken poke. And she was in the ER asked uh, if I would come pray for her at the ER. That she was in the ER. So I made my way over there. It took me about three stops to make it from my car to the ER to go in and pray for her. And I had a heart attack in the ER. <laughs> <laughs> what a God. Yeah, I went in there and they did an open heart surgery on me. I never took no pain medicine. Nope. Never had no pain. Wow. No pain whatsoever. What a God. What a God. And, uh, been doing pretty good. Just went through another little ordeal. Yeah, that's right. Well. Right. I feel great. All my kids are scared. <laughs> About Thank three or four you. years ago, my mother, and this is the part I want to get to, but I just, you know, reiterate on God's there. It, well, you go through things. But about four years ago, probably three years ago, my mother, while her husband was still alive, I, I took care of her. And they lived out on the farm, and they were cutting wood to heat their house with, the, you know, farm folks. And so I would just go out there and split her wood for her. And her house was up on a grade, and I would have to take wheelbarrows and split wood up onto her porch for her. She's in her 90s, too. And uh, I was pushing this 230 pound guy. That's what I was. I ain't like that now, but uh, I was on the chunkier side. And I was pushing that wheelbarrow. I had a heat started with wood. I thought I could, you know, young and felt like I was young anyway. I thought I could do some stuff. And I was pushing that tough little wheelbarrow. And, uh, I had to run it up a ramp and the wheelbarrow's got a foot on the front of it that you can stick it in the dark and dump it open. Right. Well, I was pushing, I had all my weight into it. I, I had all my weight pushing that wheelbarrow. I had to climb. And I hit a cross tie up there and it stopped me in there. And, all my and, I, and it, it felt like it broke my bone in my arm. I thought I broke my bone. I never heard, the heart attack didn't hurt as bad as that hurt. And I fell to the ground. I, I'm telling you, it was excruciating. That's nearly four years ago. And uh, I've had trouble with it ever since. I went and got an x-ray, I didn't break a bone, but I did something, I didn't have the money or the insurance to go find out they wanted to do whatever that machine that they used to look at your tissue and stuff. They wanted to see. I don't know if you've ever, you guys probably more so than the ladies, have ever burned brushes that certain that on that bench there last night. All right. Yeah. I've been asking the Lord. Doctors ain't kept me locked, but I have very little confidence in pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, and I asked the Lord the last couple of weeks, I said, Lord, 
He's my doctor. Sure. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, man. He's my doctor. Oh, yes, he is. Yeah. Yeah. He's a doctor, Lord. I'm not going to use the same to do stuff. Sure. But I've been asking in prayer. I said, Lord, be my doctor. Be my doctor. I trust you. Sure. Oh, you know, I was last night, and I was lifting my hands out there. Something's changed. <laughs>
Oh my God. Thank you, Jesus. I, I, but but the divine man, I mean, when I was hurting, I, my son said, Dad, where is your faith? You know? And I just broke out and started crying because when I talk about Jesus, he seems somewhat interested, but then for him to ask me, where's my faith, tells me he hears what I'm saying. I keep talking about with faith books. I mean, when people just hear the name of Jesus, when they hear of our testimonies, it, it can bring encouragement to them to do the same thing. Absolutely. You know, I'm thankful to God for my healing today. Like Sam Torrance yeah, said, uh, thank you, my back is all right. I thank you, Jesus. I my God. Thank you, Jesus. That's awesome, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for coming and be blessed. Amen. Praise God. Brother Selena, dismiss us in a word of prayer, would you? We love you, Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here with you. Yes, we are, Jesus. Thank you. We just ask you to keep your hands up on us. Yes, God. We need to God and help us to be the light of the world with your people. Yes. Help us, Lord, to reach your world. Yes. And to be more like you every day, Lord. Yes. Help us, Jesus, to understand you and to know your mind. We praise you for this man of God that you sent on the way here. Yes. Truly, yes. been blessed to us. Yes. Thank you, my pastor, is healing him and all those that yes. are here today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I know you'll continue to heal yes. in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, you will. Yes. For your glory. God bless you, love you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.